Please remain seated. The show will begin in three, two. Like a hell cut. <laughs> I'm Bem Traveler 87. Wanna hear a ghost story? Bright and early the next morning, roughly six o'clock, Clementine had gotten up out of bed, had showered, and gone dressed into her usual attire before heading to the mess hall for a hearty breakfast. She ate blueberry pancakes smothered with maple syrup, scrambled eggs with salsa, hash browns with ketchup, a side of sausage links with a glass of milk. She had sat down, looking over the scrapbook a bit more that Aggie had given her. It contained all sorts of newspaper clippings and other documentation regarding the McGrimley family origin, especially when the land was founded. It goes all the way back in the lineage about 1927. During that time period, residing within the area, The McGrimley clan were the very first settlers that came a hundred miles into Shadowhaven and had built a home for themselves on the very outskirts where the camp now resides. Merrill Lancaster McGrimley was the local sheriff, a father to six sons and a husband to five different women who were half his age. He also secretly owned 12 slaves that did back-breaking work. And no matter the cost, he wanted one thing in the world as he was a bit of an ambitious dreamer. And if there is one thing in the world that he loved, other than himself, of course, was money. A 55-year-old, ruthless, cold, extremely strict, bigoted, and unpleasant presence in the town of Shadowhaven that everyone was afraid of because his word was law and nobody would dare stand up to him. Six months go by and Merle becomes increasingly obsessed with obtaining a sacred treasure that supposedly has a curse placed on it, once belonging to a band of gypsies who were refugees that allegedly inhabited the mountains surrounding his home on that island. And as legend goes, should anyone not pure of heart try to remove the treasure chest from its domain, without permission and without an invitation would endure great misfortune, sickness, injury, poverty, even death, and their souls would be sacrificed to appease the mountain spirits of the land. Now, old Merrill certainly was not a believer in curses, nor anything supernatural for that matter. His attention was primarily focused on getting results. Even if he had to put somebody 
in his line of fire in a very risky, potentially dangerous situation, especially if it were to cost them their own life. And despite the arguments from his sons, as well as his wives, and the pleas from those around him who were underpaid, underfed, and forced to doing grueling, agonizingly, mentally torturous, excruciatingly physical, long, tedious, labor day-to-day, reckless, irresponsible, ignorant, neglectful, stingy, cowardly, grotesquely, foolishly, blinded by stupid male pride. That would definitely screw him over in the end. One rainy, thunderous night, he sent half of his slaves into the mining shaft without protective gear or a decent source of light. And after an hour, none of them came back. Merrill became impatient. So, without even thinking thoroughly, or trying to at least be a bit rational, or even come up with a good plan, he just sent the last half of his slaves into the mining shaft to get the chest. But those ones, unfortunately, like the others, never returned. And then he demanded his own sons go into the mining shaft. And then he forced his own wives to do the same. But none of them left that mining shaft. None of them came back home. And it was only Merrill left remaining. Frustrated, he ventured into that mining shaft. And what became of him afterwards? Well, law enforcement, his own deputies, hadn't heard from Merrill in a while. And neither saw any of his family members. The only thing that they discovered was an empty house. Nobody in plain sight. But when they had gone to the lake shore, floating in the water, were shoes. All they found were shoes. It was eerie and strange. Nobody had an explanation for that, but nobody could prove that those shoes belonged to any of the people on that island. There were no bodies. And, well, that was just the end of it for Merrill. And ever since then, over the years, anyone who had gone on that island in search of that treasure, all that would remain left of them were just their shoes floating in the water. The Banshee, the guardian of the lake, it was all starting to make perfect sense. Her purpose was for those who would get too close and too curious, trying to get to the other side, to get to that bridge, she would target them because she is trying to keep Thieves, unwanted trespassers out, who don't swim in line with the one rule 
never go swimming in a lake after dark. Because that is when you are most vulnerable. And she will come after you. If you are not weary of your surroundings. If you are not knowledgeable of her presence. And for those who do see her, just like Clementine, would be paralyzed with fear. Would be mesmerized by seeing her. Because those who do see her would be trapped. And an easy target. Clementine went for a hike up to the nearby cemetery. A private cemetery where a long lineage of the entire McGrimley family was laid to rest. Clementine had to take extra precautions to not being seen by camp security and usually having to blend within the tree line and stick to the shadows. And then she would make her way to this massive slope. And there were stone steps built into that hill, which she had to climb. And then when she had gone to the top, she ducked underneath tree branches and climbed over logs until she had finally reached her destination. There were tombstones everywhere covering the perimeter. And they approximately went on for six or seven acres upon those grassy plains. And it was just very unsettling. And it made Clementine uncomfortable. But honestly, she couldn't explain why this feeling of dread overcame her. Maybe she had no business being there, but she just couldn't turn back and and try to forget everything that was happening, especially what occurred that night, that night before, where she was face to face with death. Clementine had carefully studied the text within the pages various times, and she was reviewing the pictures, and one of them had shown one of the tombstones inscribed with Aaron's mother's name. Esmeralda, who had died of polio. Clementine had wondered why this was so important, but after three or four rows, she had finally come across the tombstone that was marked with a blue X. Now, she wasn't sure what to do. Esmeralda's grave was very shallow, and Clementine had knelt down and opened her satchel, taking out a small hand shovel, which she then proceeded to dig, until the end of the shovel hit something hard, presumably the wood coffin beneath. There was a text that was written on that section of the map where the grave was marked with the blue X. Find the silver key. Clementine had then grabbed her crowbar from her satchel and slowly pried off the lid to the wooden coffin. She then closely examined the skeletal decomposed corpse of Esmeralda McGrimley then spotting the silver key tightly clutched in the bony claw. Clementine was nervous now. She had this very cold feeling that she was being watched. 
he had looked around reluctantly before taking her right hand and trying to pry the bony fingers off of the silver key. But she had pulled too hard and the bony claw ripped and snapped right off the wrist of the corpse. Clementine had panicked and she felt this huge migraine in her head and she became very dizzy and lightheaded, nearly dropping the silver key. What was she to do now and what was this key for? Aggie made all these notes upon constructing the scrapbook with all these newspapers and documents and files on these people. And Clementine was trying to figure out why. Why her? Why would Aggie trust her with something this important? Was these notes made for Clementine? It was puzzling. But there had to be a reason. Then these voices, faint but very distinct, echoey, disembodied voices started circling around her and brushes of cold air was traveling up her back, causing Clementine to tremble. She felt she wasn't alone anymore. She was darting her eyes around. And she just felt as though she was being watched. Clementine sealed the coffin lid back on with placing a few heavy rocks down and reburying the grave with huge patches of dirt with the small hand shovel before putting the silver key in her satchel and quickly hightailing out of there back to her cabin. But still, she could hear the voices at her heels and she just had a very bad feeling something was definitely wrong perhaps she did make a very terrible mistake having opened a door that perhaps she couldn't close now she had disturbed someone or something had awoken to trouble that she invited in unknowingly and she realized that perhaps she was in some sort of danger. Clementine had to get away. She eventually made her way back to the cabin. There were no witnesses and Clementine sighed with relief. She sneaked back inside and shut the door behind her. Aggie was still asleep in her bed. Clementine paced around a bit, trying to figure out what her next step would be. She walked over to the oak desk and flipped on the light. Looking back over all the information that she found, and she flipped through various other pages. Then she stopped and looked over one particular page that caught her eye. It was the picture of the mining shaft. Just how did Aggie obtain all of this stuff? Where did she get it from? Then Aggie groaned and sat up, rubbing her eyes. Clem, are you good? W what's going on? She asked. Clementine looked back at her friend. Are you a descendant of Aaron McGrimley? Is that why you gave me this scrapbook? Was this just something that you were leaving me to find? Why would you trust me with this? I don't understand. Aggie sighed, rubbing her arms rather timidly. No, I'm not related to Aaron McGrimley, she said. But I need to tell you something. Um, you know that detective that I told you about? And when you asked me if I knew his name, 
Well, I promised my grandpa I wouldn't say anything, but him and that detective are friends. See, they both worked in um, law enforcement together, especially um, in their younger years when they were in their 30s. Um, and my grandpa was also investigating the homicide and he, he, he swore me to secrecy not to tell anyone and he he begged the detective you know not to bother our family anymore and just to let it go but the detective the detective came by my grandpa's house when my grandpa was out running errands and I was in the backyard just minding my own business sketching and playing with a few of my dolls and then I saw him standing behind the barbed wire fence in a brown trench coat and his face was a bit covered so well I mean I knew who he was but his name I couldn't remember and I asked him what he was doing there but all he could tell me was that he had to give something to me. He sounded desperate and honestly, I kept pressing him for answers, but he just handed me this paper, this map with locations marked on it with blue X's and and then there was instructions to follow. But I didn't want to get mixed up on all this because I, I knew my grandpa would be upset if he found out. But I figured if there's anyone I could trust and share this sort of thing with, it's it's you, Clem. And then but with all this other stuff going on at this camp, all these disappearances still, and these really strange occurrences, and... Well, I didn't, I just wanted some validation, and I, I just needed someone's support, and I, I figured that you could help me find out just why all this was going on. I don't want to do this alone, and I know that it's sudden, and it's a lot to ask of you, but there's just something very wrong with this camp. And I think that you're the only one I can really trust. And I know some of it doesn't make any sense, but you're the only hope that I have. Aggie looked distraught. Physically and emotionally drained. She sluggishly got out of bed, putting on her pink robe and matching fuzzy slippers. Then walking over to Clementine's right side, putting her left hand on her shoulder. They stared at each other for a moment. Then Aggie peered out the window, staring at the lake, and her eyes focused on the bridge. Her face mixed with fury and sorrow. Her voice broke a little as she spoke. It was two years ago, she said. Um, I went to camp with my cousin, Ralphie. R Ralphie was... <sighs> he was eight. And he loved to fish. He would do so every night. And it was towards the end of summer. Ralphie and I used to be very close. It was just the last week before school started. And he just became very distant and withdrawn, a bit defensive. Whenever I asked him what he was up to, you see, he liked to sneak out at night to go fishing at the lake, even though there was a set curfew. And, well, he really wasn't supposed to be out by himself. I volunteered to go with him to make sure that everything would be all right, but he just said that... I needed to mind my own business. He told me that he just wanted to spend time with his friend. 
I asked him who his friend was, and then he described her to me. Nine feet tall, gray skin, wearing a white torn dress, snow white hair, no eyes. I thought that, okay, his friend's imaginary. He was lonely and a bit alienated by all the other kids his age. Nobody wanted to be around him, obviously, the whole time. But... And so I didn't really think too much of it. I just figured, well, he, just, he was just a kid, you know? And, well, and then, then, and well, then that's when I got more concerned when he would just, um, isolate himself even more, refusing to eat and refusing to sleep. And he he wouldn't let anyone go near him. He wouldn't even let me hug him or... Anything like that. It, I, I don't know. Something had completely changed him. And everybody was puzzled. And, well, nobody wanted to waste their breath with him. So they just left him alone. But I wanted to find out what was wrong. And he just kept saying that his friend was lonely and she just wanted him to join her in the water. He kept repeating that constantly. He would m mumble about it um, during breakfast, lunch, dinner. And even his bunkmates were complaining about him doing it in the middle of the night in his sleep. Just mumbling about she wants him to join her. I... I was really starting to freak out because I thought that, okay, whoever this friend was could hurt him or even do something much worse. And I, I didn't want that to happen. So... About... Two or three nights later, I woke up to the sound of singing, a woman singing, and and then I looked out my window and I saw Ralphie in some sort of trance. He was barefoot in his pajamas. Walking across the sandy, rocky shore to the the lake, stopping, and he was staring at someone or something, and it was just, it was that thing that he had told me about. She was real. I couldn't believe it. Nine feet tall, gray skin, snow white hair that went down to her ankles, a torn white dress, and she beckoned to him. I rushed outside. I carried a lit lantern, and I trudged through the water as I leaped across the shore, trying to get to him. But my cousin was pulling farther away from me, as though by some invisible hands. They were just dragging him away towards her. And I had stopped when her head jerked in my direction. She was blind, but she could hear my movements. She had opened her jaw wide, showing these yellow, jagged, sharp teeth. And she had black talons fingers that were more than a foot long. I don't know why how anyone could do this. My cousin didn't deserve to be taken. I tried. I tried to grab him but then I was thrown and I landed on the gravel. And I had broken my my ankle. 
I was groaning in pain, and I was starting to lose consciousness. I had then blacked out, and I woke up the next morning in the infirmary. There were a couple cops there, Miss Barb, and my, my parents. They were asking me what happened, and I told them. Nobody believed me. And Miss Barb, she just laughed. They all looked at me as though I was crazy. But I know what I saw. That thing took my cousin. Miss Barb, once again, covered the whole thing up as if it was though nothing. I just... I was, I was then sent home. And... My parents were angry, and they were yelling at Miss Barb, threatening to sue her for child negligence and endangerment, but they couldn't prove that she did anything wrong. After all, it was my cousin that snuck out, but then again, security, they argued, could have stopped him. They could have notified the staff. But there wasn't much they could do. So uh, the police set out an investigation trying to find Ralphie. They had searched for days. And then days turned into months. And so much time had passed that they gave up the search. But I never stopped trying. I never stopped trying to... put this all to an end. And then, when I was at my grandpa's house, I... I... I, I, I begged him. Well, I begged him to tell me if there was anyone who could help us. And he said that we just had to just let it go. Because if we try to dig deeper in, and, well, we would find ourselves in a hole that we couldn't d dig ourselves out of. Because if we had to open another can of worms, it would just meant more legal trouble for us. Because Miss Barb threatened us with a huge lawsuit for harassment, and making all these, what she would call, false accusations, trying to sabotage her reputation. So, we all had to stay silent. But I can't take this anymore, Clem. I, I just... I, I can't do this by myself. Well... Even if we haven't known each other for very long, maybe we both need to consider ourselves very lucky. Either one of us could have ended up like Ralphie and those other children, you know? But I'd like to think that this Banshee, this lake spirit, she was human once. Maybe. If we had just got to know more about her, then maybe we could put a stop to all of that. D don't you think? Because there's gotta be something influencing her. I, I don't like to think that she's just some sort of monster who just wants to hurt children. There, there's gotta be more to this than we than than any of us thought. So, what are we going to do, Clem? Aggie asked. Well, we're going to definitely have to plan this carefully. And just give this a bit of time. Because right now, seeing as I haven't been here for very long, I don't want my dad having to drive all the way back here to take me home. And I certainly don't want you to be stuck dealing with all this on your own. 
So we're going to have to plan this very, very carefully and not draw any suspicion onto ourselves. We have to be very, very careful, you understand? Even the short time that I've been here, I've always kind of felt that there was something a little weird with Miss Barb. But I, I never thought that it could be anything to this extent. And I'm glad that you could come to me about this. So, let's just g give it a few days or something. And then we can um, get back to it and try to figure something out. I was at the cemetery and I, I came across Esmeralda's grave. You know, um, Aaron's mother? So you managed to get the key acquired, Aggie. Yes, I did. But then I was kind of chased out of there. I think there's ghosts in the cemetery. Do you think that perhaps um, they're angry that I took this? No, I think they were trying to warn you. Because if that key goes to the treasure, then I, I think they're all afraid that you're going to be a victim of the curse too. And end up like the rest of them. Because everyone buried in that cemetery was trying to get to the treasure. This whole thing is insane, Clementine thought to herself. Her second night at camp. And all of this was just spiraling all at once. This is definitely not how she expected to spend her summer vacation. But I think that maybe her family was oblivious to all this history, this dark past that Camp Carnegie was trying to hide from the other campers. Just why would anyone want to open this place to kids only for them to fall victim to these accidents or disappearances? You think that would just draw a lot of negative attention and publicity. It definitely didn't set well right for Miss Barbara's image. Just why? Okay, guys, I'm going to leave the story here for now. I really hope that you are liking it so far. A lot of time energy editing, especially with the audio, and just all the time that I've spent all day, well, the past few days trying to get this done, I really hope that you appreciate my efforts. And... I hope that you will hit that notification bell to stay updated for all future videos. And of course, please check out all my other content as well. Like and subscribe, people. I would really appreciate your support. I love you all to the tune and back. Please remember to keep your windows barred shut and curtains drawn. Doors locked up tight. And before you go to sleep tonight, always look underneath your bed. I'm Phantom Traveler 87. Until next time, bye.